Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Keith Garner, Superintendent and CEO of Wesley Mission. As we gather for our mission anniversary, it is an appropriate day, Pentecost Sunday. An appropriate day when we think of the high significance that that day has in the story of the Christian church. People were gathered together in one place, followers of Jesus who were wondering just what the outlook was going to be for them as a community. Following all that had happened in crucifixion and even in resurrection, for even after resurrection they had the doors locked. And they wondered just what was to happen. Then out of heaven came a a howling, fierce wind. Flames of fire came to rest on all present. They were filled with power and began to speak of all the things that God had done for them in Christ. So much so that people heard those words, each in their own and many languages. And the message that would go to the ends of the world was beginning to win its way into the hearts of people in the marketplace. The descent of the Spirit upon the church is the beginning of our life. Who could have anticipated such power being poured out on these people? And so the text is verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Is it really a mighty wind of change or the hot air of a church looking for a purpose? For those of us concerned about mission today, it remains important to seek out the purpose and will of the Holy Spirit in all that we say and do. To seek the presence of the Spirit upon our witness together as God's people. Previously, we hear in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, the disciples are to remain in Jerusalem. But you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Without the Holy Spirit, the disciples have a discipleship that is inconceivable. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life amongst the people of God. Without the Holy Spirit, God's power can never display Christ-likeness amongst his followers. And without the Holy Spirit, there is no vibrant witness into the future. As one Christian writer put it, as a body without breath is a corpse, so the church is without the Spirit of God. Both John and Luke present the coming of the Spirit in important terms, but both relating to the concept, analogy, picture, experience of wind. The Lucan version is that of a mighty wind, whereas John speaks of a gentle breath. The distinct difference is that in Acts, all the people in the area take notice. This is no private event. This is no privatized religion. What is happening now in these moments would change history forever. There would be irrevocable implications for what happens in this marketplace where the Spirit of God comes upon the life of the church. We're told that everybody took notice. Not a personal and quiet moment of inspiration. Each has something to say, but in the Acts of the Apostle, the response of people is quite remarkable. They've had too much wine. Nine o'clock in the morning, too much wine. Now, we deal with alcoholism, and it's true to say that the effects of alcohol can go round the clock, but not too many have been out getting drunk at nine in the morning. And the accusation of those first disciples is that there was something remarkable about them. There was something that you couldn't miss. There was something that was all powerful, that all those stood around wanted to say something about, even if they did not all understand it. So let's look at the experience of those looking on and divide the text neatly into three. They were amazed. 
The promised spirit comes on the church in the midst of throngs of pilgrims for Jewish religious festivals, meeting in Jerusalem, all there. But they were amazed for what was happening was not what usually happened when they gathered in this way. Something unique was happening. Something that in one sense would never be repeated in quite the same way. But something that would become the very inspiration of every time there's a move of God amongst his people in each and every age. Something was happening. And it would be something that would be profoundly informative for them. It would be something that would be celebrated and would call them together as a people. For this was a festival that celebrated nationhood. But now they would discover not nationhood. They would discover that they are the people of God of every language, nation, race, and the whole earth. Something that would bring together humanity in a way that it had often been broken apart. Something that would enable the Christian community to understand its unique and distinctive part in the story and history of the world. At such a time, the early church is called to own her own high purpose. They'd always seen God encountered them in traditions and liturgical patterns. There, there at a festival, that would be true again. However, Now God comes in a most unexpected way, in a way that is both disturbing, in a way that is refreshing, in a way that is renewing, in a way that is invigorating, in a way that is transformative for the story of all time. God reaches beyond their religious infrastructure. God reaches beyond the wildest extent of their anticipated dreams we do need to rediscover a sense of God's activity that disturbs us, that makes us aware of the God of constant change, that makes us aware of the God that renews all peoples, the God that reaches beyond our human languages, a God that meets us beyond all our distinctive separations and brings us together in a common purpose. The birth of the church comes out of these events at Pentecost. From this moment on, they'll never be the same again. You see, God cannot be neatly placed within special parameters that we build to box him in. God will open doors of faith and new windows on service. And God's presence will make these disciples fearless. The lock is off the door once and for all time. Now, within a short period of time, they would know what it was in the city of Jerusalem to be a poor church in need of support from others, knowing what it is to be spread a new diaspora of Christian people across the whole earth. And it is this power that will make them fearless. Within a short number of years, many of the disciples who stood up with Peter when he preached his famous Pentecost sermon would die for their faith. This is not a Sunday school picnic. This is the very heart of what makes the church in the midst of a world with all its conflict and hurt and separation still the clarion voice for unity in this world that makes it possible for us to believe that the Christian faith is not locked into one national or one cultural pattern. But some of the greatest areas of growth are in new places and exciting places, for the word that went out at Pentecost has not been taken back. And that that power is at work today. And the disciples will become conscious of a new leading, a new dynamic purpose. In the crowd, there would be many who would be amazed at what they observed, at what they heard, at what they tried to understand. As we gather on this anniversary day, we recognize the power of our word and deed ministry and that God continues to liberate through that powerful word in the world today. The marvelous liberating power, the gracious compassion, the ways in which that word goes out and makes such a difference in the lives of communities of many kinds. I see it in the hope given to clients through staff, volunteers, and congregations, through the opening of the doors of service into people's lives. You know, a distinguished church consultant was once asked the question, Why do we have such uninteresting preaching and so many static and sedate congregations? 
his surprising answer did not cite some institutional or organizational problem. He simply responded, the neglect of the third person of the Trinity. That's why the church is in trouble. If only we could capture the sense of this spirit that changes lives, that makes such a difference, that empowers the church, that makes it possible to be fearless, that makes it possible to cross the boundaries, that makes it possible to find new ways of doing things. The third person, the work of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, that is still our mandate. Without the empowering and providing of the Spirit of God, we're always in danger of just becoming another well-meanly, mostly helpful, goodwill society. But we are more than that. You see, at the heart of our words and works, our communities, our congregations, our actions, our deeds, at the heart of all that is someone, not some mysterious, someone driving us calling us, pulling us to a higher purpose. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. There are many organizations like Wesley Mission, you know, who've chosen to lay aside the Christian stuff. Because all the other is worth doing anyway. Why would you not want to help somebody in trouble? Why would you not want to enter into the pain of families torn apart for all? Of course it's worth doing. But I'll tell you a better story. It's worth doing in the name of Jesus. It's worth doing because the good news makes it possible to achieve, makes you you're able to leap over walls and, and do those things that are impossible apart from him. That's a unique congregation. That's a unique purpose. People will be in that situation challenged. You see, secondly, they were perplexed. I do get concerned when, when I have the feeling that some people think they've got it all worked out. Perplexed, I suppose, as a, other commandments to it, a puzzlement, a sense of not really having it all sorted out, but standing back and feeling, when were you last amazed, perplexed, and full of wonder at what God has done? When were you last standing there and feeling, gosh, this is God at work in this world? We need to feel again, what it is to be perplexed, not only as a crowd observing, but as the people of God. The confusion felt by the disciples and the crowd describes something of that perplexity. But I think it calls us all to something deeper. A Cambridge scholar not long ago wrote about the link between the resurrection and the moral order, suggesting there is a link. He declared the work of the Spirit as witness to the objective deed of God in Christ and his work as a life giver restores freedom and power to mankind. They're not two distinct works, but one. And we change the world when we are changed. We influence the world when we are inspired. We make a difference to this world when we are different. When we are different men, women, and young people, only when that is happening in us can there be any remote possibility of that happening in the world. But gosh, when it happens, when that change comes about, oh, how it can change communities and society. We must not lose touch with reality. Our striving for the gospel is not just an individual action but an expression of that groaning we feel of the Spirit. Read Romans 8. That groaning of the Spirit within us for something better, for a dream to, to come about that God is wanting to do through us. There are many indications in our desire to see changes in our society. We're in the midst of an election campaign, and you know, the things that bother us will not be Mr. Turnbull's highest priority. The things that concern us, Mr. Shorten will not address. I've noticed even now, they both avoid some of the biggest issues. We prefer to talk about the superannuation percentage. Now, I have to tell you, that's not unimportant. But compared to the scourge of 110,000 people every night having nowhere to live in a modern Australia that brags itself as being one of the wealthiest countries on the earth is an absolute shame. When you talk about the issues that really matter, 
gosh, there are a whole host of issues that we have to consider. And the things that strike in our heart when we're dealing with broken families and children abandoned when we deal with the focus upon the thousands of dependent people, upon the practical support and help of other people, we realize that the Christian church has to be alive, not only to answer the call to do, but the call to question and to be part of that community. In a perplexed world, we must find the words and deed that make some kind of sense. John Stott, talking about mission, once contended, before Christ sent the church into the world, he sent the spirit into the church. And the same order must be observed today. The spirit of God. We're not empowered. Would it be in my office or anybody else's office? In my congregation or anybody else's congregation, we don't have all those answers to every question and every situation. But we do know this, that the one who lives at the heart of his people, the one who calls us, provides hope of a new beginning for this world. And then thirdly, it prompted them to ask, what does it mean? You know, the reactions of the crowd is quite remarkable. What does it mean? They were amazed, they were perplexed. They said, what does it mean? Is Christ-like servanthood in its working clothes that will follow through the acts of the apostles? What are the implications for the gift of the Spirit? Where do we interpret and demonstrate the challenges of faith and service? What does it mean for us to be a community? And what does Christian community mean in the midst of many other models of community? There's a great need for power today, moral and spiritual power. The New Testament is a story about power, a theme that runs all through its pages. On one side is confusion, helplessness, and doubt. On the other side is an unshakable purpose that whatever the cost is, we will follow Jesus. It is the birth of courage in a new way. This theme or this line runs for me through the day of Pentecost. The Whitsunday Islands are to be found off that coast of northern Queensland. There's the Whitsunday Passage, of course, which Cook chose to name. Nearby is Pentecost Island, with its steep, craggy slopes, rising sheer out of the water. No wonder that that early Portuguese explorer talked about Australia as the land of the Holy Spirit. I ministered for nine years in a place in the world called Wales. It was the last major country on the earth to experience a full revival, where there was a transformation that affected people as there were miners who dug dirt from out of the earth as there were communities and villages and towns who knew what it was to be changed, that everybody talked about it. And it grew at a time when secularization was rising in Wales. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the next great place that that kind of renewal and revival happened was Australia? And wouldn't it be wonderful if it didn't just become a little bit of pious religion in a corner, but it became the kind of religion that changes how the poor are treated, that brings families together, that teaches us how to treat our children, that transforms every part of the social fabric of this world. Christianity can do that. And it can do it because deep down, the Holy Spirit has called us on a journey that we cannot, cannot and must not abrogate. We must be part of it. Mulrin Edwards wrote about the experience of John Wesley. He wrote all his earlier disciplined life of holiness and good works to which he set his hand. His primary concern on what he could do was on what he could do for God. But after the Aldersgate Street experience, he only asked what God could do for him and through him. You see, it's a secret of the Christian faith. What you understand, that religion is not what you do for God, but what God does through you. We're changed. We're different. 
Religion becomes something that isn't something we observe. It becomes a dynamic reality flowing through a church alive. At a stroke for Wesley, strain and effort were put to one side. At a stroke, he no longer had that spirit of heaviness that religion so often carries. And in one strike, the ecclesiastic of America became the evangelist of the road, all because the Holy Spirit had changed him. It's 39 years, you know, since an unknown 32-year-old film director, George Lucas, launched a film. It's made him a bob or two. He's done all right out of it. And the characters were unknown. The soundtrack and the robots likewise unfamiliar. It's hard to believe that it's become really the biggest grossing film when put together in that series of all time, Star Wars. From the beginning, people were drawn to it. But the story begins, if some of you remember the first one, it begins with these words, Star Wars, episode four. Now, who would go to watch an episode four of anything? But it's far more interesting in this case to start in the middle. In episode, if episode one was the life and ministry of Jesus, culminating in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, episode two is the life and work of that spirit amongst his people central to all the truly immersive, fandom-generating universes of popular culture, Doctor Who, Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and even the Marvel comics again. When you look at all of them, they borrow a concept that was invented at its best in its fullest sense by Tolkien. Tolkien talked about the promise of fellowship. He, of course, is, was a, a massively significant Christian. Who I, I was always thrilled to see young people sat there, you know, and, 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 and when you look at some of those books, Lord of the Rings, I mean, they're bigger than, than a library in themselves. You see kids carrying these things around. They're, you know they're reading. But, you know, in the middle of them all, there is this, this fellowship, this, this relationship between people that calls them to something better. I met a close friend of Tolkien when I was preaching once in, in my own church. And I'm fascinated that his works, which incidentally, the, the New Zealand Tourist Board will be thrilled about because they've half helped to float the, the New Zealand economy. But he's captivated a whole new generation. Social isolation is a feature of modern life. And it's unconsciously present everywhere. Even such rugged individualists like Sherlock Holmes and James Bond are surrounded by webs of familiar and supporting players. You can't be a hero on your own. You can't be a star in the team without the team. And the great thing about Pentecost when it came upon this church was that all of them became part of a massively inspired and motivated team that made a huge difference. An intrinsic part of our Christian faith is the belonging together, is the taking of that, that wind and letting it blow and touch every part of the life of that community of faith. Throughout history, we've been conscious of the gift of God. A number of weeks ago at an evening service, I referred to Bishop Will Willimon. He was a bishop in Alabama and tells the story of a meeting one night in a small Methodist church. It was one of those subjects being discussed that everybody loves to have a discussion on. What's wrong with the church? You'll always get a crowd to an evening if you announce that as a title. So they came together to talk about the, the weaknesses and problems of the church. And it went on until one woman rose to her feet. A black member of a mixed race church. And this is what she said. I spent 38 years thinking God was mad at me. I tried this and I tried that to get God to like me. When I came here for the first time, I learned about grace. This church, for all its problems, is the place where God finally brought me to my senses about what God really thinks about me. It's now my job to go and tell everybody else that God's not mad at them, that he actually loves them. 
And I think we have to be part of that recognition that still at the heart of our message is that of a God of love. I'm busy preparing an address for a, for a different context for a church uh, uh, conference I've been part of called The Church in the Main Street. Bishop Gavin Reed, who for many years was the Bishop of Maidstone, has special responsibility under the auspices of the Archbishop of Canterbury on evangelism. He wrote a book in the 1970s, which is largely um, unread now. It was about uh, media and multimedia and how communication takes place called the gagging of God. But he had one concept that arrested me as a young evangelist. And it was that there is a distinction between in-drag and outreach. In-drag is staying where you are and expecting people to come and listen to your arguments on your turf and your place. Outreach is to go where people are. And that's what was happening at Pentecost. For perhaps the first time, these disciples realized that they had a responsibility and a role to go out into the world. 204 years. Well, earlier today, I shared with our Chinese friends celebrating 27 years 27 years since happenings at Tiananmen Square and elsewhere in China forced many people to come and live in this beautiful city of ours. And a congregation that knows so many of their roots are in the difficult circumstances that occurred then. But we celebrate 204 years when what we are about began with a small group of people in the rocks area of this Sydney crying out for purpose. Send us a preacher lest we die in our sins, they wrote to London. But you know, I hope you're not offended if I say I can put those two anniversaries to one side any day. For the anniversary that we celebrate today is Pentecost. It goes back 2,000 years. And it goes back to a group of men, for they were all men at that very first Pentecost, who were locked away. And the bolt was pulled back. And they went into that square and Peter stood up and said, men of Israel, and preached. Wind came amongst them. Tongues of flame rested on those that were speaking. It was a different day. And it was the day that has never been taken back. God didn't say Pentecost was just for a moment in time. He said it's for all. And here at Wesley Mission on this anniversary day, let's celebrate 204 years, let's celebrate 27, but let's celebrate the gift of the Spirit of God and leave this place new and different people because God has blessed us afresh. And if you feel the wind, just just open your lungs and let it blow through. Let the wind of the Spirit just touch you as a people. Be new, be different, be inspired, and be led out. For God is continually working amongst us.